Hello. Uh, thank you very much, Martin, and the organizers for having us here. Uh, so I am Andre. Uh, I'm currently based in uh, Zurich uh, at the university, so this presentation might be a bit different to what you've seen so far. But um, I'm very excited to be here, uh, specifically because uh, I think six years ago I did my part two here in London. And this is an image from my um, uh, diploma. And um, even back then I was already intrigued by this uh, gap that uh, was existing between the unlimited possibilities that one has in the digital environment and uh, what can actually be physically fabricated. So uh, about two years ago, I moved to Zurich and I joined um, Digital Building Technologies, which was a new chair at uh, ETH Zurich. Uh, and uh, partly the scope of this uh, chair was to uh, bridge this gap between the uh, digital environment and the physical. So these are a couple of slides with samples of the work that was uh, being done at uh, DBT. This is the um, incidental space. It was designed by Christian Carrots, and the digital fabrication was done by DBT, and it was heavily relying on uh, 3D printing. Um, and then this is uh, the Digital Grotesque 2. It was a commission from uh, the Saint Pompidou in Paris for Benjamin Dillenburger. He's the professor of the chair, together with uh, Michael Hansmeier. Um, uh, so here it's again, we're very interested in high resolution uh, and how this, uh, what the role of high resolution has in architectural spaces. So nevertheless, uh, 3D printed materials are not fully suitable for uh, architectural purposes. So especially when we're talking about load bearing elements and especially about tension, uh, these are not fully suitable. However, 3D printing has um, several great advantages that we are fascinated by. It has um, a lot of applications in other industries. Uh, this is in uh, the medical industry, uh, a lot of prosthetic uh, devices, implants, hearing aids. They're all fabricating using 3D printing nowadays. And this is because 3D printing lends itself very well to mass customization. So as opposed to um, mass production or prefabrication, and of course, as architects, we're very intrigued by this idea that we can customize every space and make bespoke, com bespoke components and so on. Uh, and last but not least, uh, lately 3D printing has also been associated with uh, topology optimization. Uh, so topology optimization generally produces very complex geometries, which are difficult to fabricate with uh, conventional fabrication processes. This is a heat exchange unit from Autodesk. Uh, and again, when we talk about optimizing topologies and reducing material, of course, in architecture, we are responsible for the most used material in the world, which is concrete. Actually, second most used if we also take into account water. But um, it's not just the amount of concrete that's being used nowadays, but also the fact that it's an ever-increasing amount. And this is a statistic from Vaclav's mill from a few years ago, uh, which says that China nowadays, every three years, uses more concrete than the United States has used in the entire 20th century. So this gives a, a good perspective. And it's not just the amount of concrete that we use, but also the fact that nowadays we see more and more this kind of image where concrete is being used in these uh, monolithic and oversized, prefabricated, um, very similar uh, monolithic components. And this is despite the fact that uh, concrete has this um, great potential of being molded into any shape. So it's been praised by architects um, since, uh, since a long time ago, and um, people like Felix Candela and Sergio Musmeci have uh, pushed the boundaries of what can be done with uh, concrete. And also, uh, Pierre Luigi Nervi was also one of the pioneers who pushed uh, freeform concrete components uh, in architecture. And he's the one who also identified why concrete is still, why, why this uh, freeform in concrete is still um, an isolated uh, um, example. But, Mostly it's, uh, it's this uh, orthogonal and monolithic components that we see. And this is the, the need to make wooden frames, what he calls so basically we need to make formworks. And uh, this becomes even a bigger issue when we take into account the fact that, the fact that formwork uh, is usually responsible for more than 50% of the resources uh, involved in uh, concrete constructions. And this is for standard geometries. When we talk about uh, special geometries and free forms, uh, this uh, proportion can increase up to 80%. So 
I think you've seen this idea uh, before also in uh, Hedwig's presentation earlier, but um, it's great that somehow we reached the same conclusion and this is where all the puzzle pieces come together. So what we want to do is obviously reach this very high resolution that I showed before in concrete. Uh, we like concrete because it's an excellent material with excellent structural properties. Um, however, to uh, make the necessary formworks, as Nervi said, we need to use uh, 3D printing. So what, what you see here, the, the little, um, sorry, the narrow shell on the outside is a 3D printed uh, formwork. Um, and on the inside we cast um, high performance concrete. So I'm talking about 3D printing formwork, but 3D printing uh, is an umbrella term. It encompasses a few different types of technologies. And I will talk uh, about two of these technologies that we focused on uh, at DBT. Uh, the one on the left is actually an image from uh, the camera maker uh, from Dus Architects. So it's the same technology, it's extruding plastic. And later I will talk about binder jetting, which is based on um, uh, layers of powder. So what you see here is a very thin shell. It's less than a millimeter in thickness. Uh, which was 3D, printing, 3D printed using uh, plastic, and this was used as a formwork to produce uh, this component over here. Uh, it was, I think, about uh, 50 centimeters in length, and uh, it displays this very shallow texture, which was uh, very nicely inherited from the 3D printed formwork. Uh, and also the removal of the formwork was uh, relatively straightforward. Uh, applying a little bit of heat, the formwork simply peeled off the component and left the concrete clean in the end. Uh, so we did a few, a few experiments, a few tests to see how we can push the um, uh, geometries that uh, we can do with concrete with this technology. And here is a column that displays these, uh, this network of tubes, which are as thin as uh, I think 15 millimeter. So something that's um, quite unprecedented with concrete. Here we have these very deep folds and um, uh, details that are a few millimeters inside. Again, uh, quite unique for concrete. And uh, I think there should be a video here. Um, maybe Martin can help me. It was uh, working uh, earlier. Anyway, we are um, uh, architects, so we wanted to focus on, I'll probably just skip it. We wanted to focus on uh, large scale um, objects. So uh, we had a great opportunity to um, do nothing else but a concrete boat. This was for a competition in uh, Germany. Uh, and I know it sounds quirky, but it's a, quite a long-standing competition. Um, so we fabricated the formwork. Uh, unfortunately, I will try again the video, maybe, because it's... Uh, I think it uh, got completely stuck. I don't know what's, uh, what's going on. Ah, there it is, sorry. Um, so yeah, we, we had this opportunity to do a fun project, which was a concrete boat. So um, we fabricated the 3D printed formwork, as I described before, using plastic extrusion. And the boat was about four meter long. So um, we had to discretize the formwork in, I think, about 84 pieces uh, in order to fit our uh, little printer's printing volumes. These are, these are the, the 84 pieces. Uh, these were assembled together using a chemical welding process uh, to make the formwork for the entire boat. Uh, and then the casting process, we had to put it in a box, and uh, while we cast concrete inside, inside this uh, uh, skeleton formwork, from the outside we had to fill it in at the same time with, uh, with sand. This is uh, because we had to be prepared in case uh, the 100 kilos of concrete that we cast inside the boat would uh, break this uh, super thin submillimeter uh, formwork that we had on the outside. So these are some um, uh, close-ups from the results. Uh, again, these are, I think, um, 10 to 15 millimeter uh, bones. And uh, the texture that you see here is only a few millimeters, uh, these edge, uh, edges of the, of the mesh that you see here. Uh, so again, it was a very faithful um, uh, geometry that was inherited from the 3D printed formwork. We also had some very complex topologies with some uh, spatial nodes. Uh, and this is the, the skeleton for the entire boat, so this was the structure. It was done with uh, topology optimization. So um, we started from a very traditional uh, Native American uh, canoe shape. 
And through topology optimization, we managed to only uh, keep the material that was needed uh, for the specific load case of the canoe. So in the middle there, you see some denser points where the two people rowing uh, would stand or, or, or knee on. Uh, and this is the picture from the competition. Uh, and as I said, I think there were about a thousand students there with 90 concrete boats. So a lot of quirky people uh, uh, crossing the Rhine in Cologne that day. And I think we're the most innovative co uh, quirky people because we got this award from uh, Lafarge for the uh, innovation in concrete construction. Uh, and as I said, uh, there are two technologies that we focused on. So far I talked about uh, plastic extrusion. Uh, the other one is based on um, uh, powder printing. So this is based on um, uh, uh, um, quartz sand that is then uh, selectively bound with uh, resin. Uh, and once uh, the entire process is finished, the loose uh, sand particles are removed to, to leave the, the finished part, which is what you can see here. And um, it has several advantages over plastic extrusion. It has a bit more geometric freedom, uh, but it's also a little bit less stable. So you see here the formwork is no longer less than a millimeter thick, but uh, I think six to nine millimeters is what we, what we ended up using. Uh, and also in section here, you see our concrete is, uh, is uh, full of steel fibers. This is ultra high performance um, concrete. And we did a lot of uh, rheology tests with our colleagues from uh, physical chemistry of building materials to see uh, the length of fibers and the proportion of fibers that was uh, best suitable for our um, complex geometry. So at some point, if the, radia, the bending radii in these tubes is uh, too small, the fibers would just clog up and the concrete would stop flowing. Uh, so as I said, again, we rely a lot on topology optimization to uh, remove the material um, in order to um, uh, make our components more efficient. And uh, we had different uh, load cases. Uh, at this point, I was still very um, tempted to do another boat, but uh, it was peer pressure that uh, I, in the end I had to do something more conventional. So this is um, uh, a slab demonstrator. So these were two square meter slabs uh, experiments that we did. Uh, here, the load case was for four supports in the corner. So it's the blue, blue parts in the end. And we optimized for minimizing uh, strain energy. Uh, and what would normally be a two square meter slab uh, would be something like this. Conventionally, it would weigh about uh, 650 kilograms. But after the topology optimization, we managed to reduce the weight by about 70%. Uh, and this is a view from uh, underneath, and uh, again, this uh, very complex uh, tubular structure would be very difficult to fabricate with any other uh, process. Uh, so these are just a few slides. Uh, this shows the formwork before the concrete is cast in. It's being prepared. Uh, this is uh, already with the concrete inside, and we were a little bit uh, hesitant at first to test it structurally. But in the end, the entire team was uh, standing there, and I think even the structure engineer dared to step on it. Uh, and as I said, we did um, uh, several iterations of this uh, slab demonstrator. This one was for a bit of a different load case with only three support points. Uh, and also the fabrication constraints were slightly different. But again, we show here geometries that are very difficult to fabricate in concrete otherwise. And here we also integrated a layer of extra functionality on the top. These um, uh, tessellated subdivisions which are uh, increasing the acoustic performance of this uh, uh, slab panel. So uh, finally, uh, I will talk about uh, a real life application of the research we've done so far. Um, we are funded by uh, the NCCR Digital Fabrication. It's a federal program in Switzerland which funds a few projects at uh, ETH and uh, a few other universities. So I think uh, Stefana later on will uh, um, uh, talk a little bit about uh, other projects that are going on inside the NCCR, but I will uh, focus on the, the red bit I highlighted there, which is the smart slab, uh, which is basically a concrete slab that we fabricate using um, uh, 3D printed formwork. So the context of uh, this project was uh, quite challenging. Uh, we had an S-shaped support wall. So I'm talking about the slab on the top now. And the support was uh, this S-shaped wall. And we had the cantilever all around a uh, maximum of four and a half uh, meters. And uh, a conventional concrete slab for this particular scenario, it was about eight, 80 square meters, would weigh about uh, 50 tons, or slightly under 50 tons. But um, through the computational optimizations that we can do, 
uh, and by uh, optimizing the distribution of material in order to minimize deflection and strain energy and so on, we managed to reduce the weight of this slab to uh, only 17 tons. So this is again about 70% uh, material reduction. And um, the ribs that you see here that uh, emerge from this uh, articulated surface are all post-tensioned. So it's not just a 3D printed formwork, but a few other uh, innovative ideas that um, uh, are combined in order to be able to save so much material. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the um, design process. We started together with our structure engineers with um, a simple diagram, which uh, is a hierarchical distribution of, uh, of this organic uh, grid of ribs, which reacts to the context. Uh, each of these ribs uh, contains a post-tensioning tendon. And starting from this very simple diagram, um, we uh, generated a very simple mesh with a few dozen faces. And then after several iterations of uh, selective subdivision sequences and um, selective smoothing operations, uh, the final mesh that we generated was about 13 million faces. Uh, so I think on average the edge length was uh, about 3 millimeter, but this was um, uh, dynamically adapting depending on how dense the geometry was in that uh, specific location. So of course this is a relatively big slab. It's not like the two uh, square meter demonstrators we did before. This is about 11 and a half meters in length. So to fabricate this we had to discretize it in 11 segments uh, which were prefabricated and then uh, assembled on site. Uh, so this is the formwork for uh, one of the segments. And again, due to the uh, geometric freedom that we have with 3D printing, we're able not only to include the, uh, this uh, very articulated surface, but also to include details for precisely positioning reinforcement bars, uh, the post-tensioning tendons, and also for integrating uh, all the functionality that is necessary for a, for a functional slab. So we have uh, electrical conduits and um, light fittings and uh, sprinklers and uh, water pipes and everything that, that's necessary is already integrated in the formwork and transferred to the concrete. Also there's, um, because we had in the end about 180 formwork parts, uh, there is some um, uh, smart features that are in integrated in the formwork to help assembly. So there's a lot of uh, referencing pins and uh, positioning pegs and uh, the formwork itself is also optimized to reduce the weight. So I think this, is, uh, this was segment four. This is how the 3D printed formwork looked like. This is about seven and a half meters long. Um, this is a detail on the left and on the right hand side is Theo Bürgen, who is the uh, contractor who was uh, incredibly dedicated and he made this uh, project possible. So here we use a slightly different uh, concrete, which is a lightweight mix uh, with um, uh, glass fibers. And uh, he's uh, spraying the, the formwork that you see there on the left. And actually, I just have, uh, to, to wrap up my presentation, a few slides from uh, last week. So I think this is actually on Friday, as uh, segment number 11 was uh, lowered on the, next to the other ones. Yeah, this is the view from the top. Here you see these uh, structural ribs that are being post-tensioned. Uh, this is a view from the side. So you see again these ribs in section with a hole in the middle for post-tensioning. And uh, I think the ribs are 60 to 30 centimeters in height, and the interstitial surface, the one that you saw Theo spraying earlier, is only about one and a half centimeters in uh, thickness. Uh, so again, this uh, doesn't have a load-bearing role, but it's there to stabilize the entire system, and also it uh, provides this uh, visible surface, uh, which is uh, highly ornamented on the other side. And finally, this is uh, an image from um, uh, the space itself. Uh, the last last segment here was not uh, fully adjusted, so you see this seam. I, I, I just took the picture be before it was finished. Uh, still, once it was uh, adjusted on site, we measured about two millimeter uh, tolerance, which uh, for an um, 11 and a half meter long slab was uh, not too bad. Uh, but anyway, it's such a convoluted geometry that no one would notice anyway, so. Uh, anyway, I think I, I've uh, reached my uh, allocated minutes, so there's not so much time to reflect on what I just said, but um, again, a lot of these ideas have been uh, mentioned before that with digital fabrication, things are changing a lot, and I think it's not only the design products and the design process that's uh, changing, but also the way we build on-site is changing. Uh, and I think more on that will come from the next presentation. So 
I talked a little bit about what we do at ETH, but the really cool stuff will be in the next presentation. So thank you very much.